today. And if you remember when we left off um, at the beginning of the weekend, uh, Jackson had killed the Bank of the United States. And remember, he doesn't like the bank because he believes that it's controlled by an Eastern elite uh, and that it uh, you know, that hurts the farmers um, and the, the, the common person. And so through a combination of things, he he kills the bank and he, you know, he makes sure that the bank doesn't get rechartered in 1836. He sees his election in 1832 as a mandate to do whatever he wants. And so he starts withdrawing money from the um, from the, the Bank of the United States and depositing into his you know banks that would do what he wanted to do. And we call those pet banks. And so these are state banks that get federal funds. And um, then he, you know, he, he takes government deposits and never puts them in the Bank of the United States. And so effectively, it's a bank with no money. And at that point, then, um, you know, it, the, the Bank of the United States is, is kind of uh, dead. OK, so between Indian removal, between um, killing the Bank of the United States, um, and, and, you know, all these other things that have gone on, it, there's a lot of people that are beginning to kind of come together uh, against Andrew Jackson. You can see this um, political cartoon in the bottom right hand corner where Andrew Jackson is just stepping on a ripped up piece of the Constitution and it uh, kind of sardonically casts him as Andrew the first. So King Andrew the first. And he's using his power of veto, um, you know, to, to get rid of any bills that come his way that he doesn't want. Now, what's going to eventually happen then is that the National Republicans and people that are discontent in various corners with Andrew Jackson, they are going to coalesce to create something called the Whig Party. And more than anything, the thing that they have in common is that they just don't like, they don't like Andrew Jackson. All right, so who makes up this Whig Party? Well, it's the old kind of Federalists. So we're talking about the merchants, the bankers, the manufacturers. Um, but, you know, even some wealthy planners of the South, they're, they're in, in with the, the merchants, the bankers. Um, white Anglo-Saxon Protestants. Uh, remember at this time that we're going to start seeing, uh, you know, many Irish and eventually Germans start coming into America. And, uh, you know, the, the Whigs are going to start uh, courting those, I guess you would say, nativists. And so while the Irish, especially, they loved the common man like Andrew Jackson and the party of the Democrats, what we're going to start to see the Whigs do is they are going to court kind of the nativist vote. And that's still a very strong vote to some degree. And so we call those people white Anglo-Saxon Protestants and uh, or wasps, as oftentimes they're going to get. And they, uh, you know, they typically voted for the Whig party during this time. All right. So even though the Whigs initially didn't have like an official platform, um, you know, they're, they're key things. And so, you know, this is really you know, this is the party of Henry Clay. This is, uh, you know, this is an American system, high protective tariffs on imports, uh, you know, federal support for infrastructural improvements, canals, roads, that kind of thing. And uh, then, of course, they would like to reissue the charter for the Bank of the United States. Um, something that's kind of similar to Andrew Jackson is they, they do want a strong central government. They do want, um, you know, they, they are unionists. And so this is not where they and Andrew Jackson differ. It's, it's more of kind of who's in control of the government and the kind of, kind of the way they execute the powers of the central government. So we're not talking really, uh, you know, here about national government versus states' rights. We're more talking about either you're kind of for the American system or you're against it. And the Whigs are more for the American system and the Democrats are more against it. Okay. And, uh, you know, they, if they were going to get categorized, they would get categorized more as loose constructionists. All right. So that is the Whig party. So as 1836 comes, um, Jack, you know, Jackson, they had to, they had to, 
his people had to kind of convince him to run for a second time. And so by 1836, he is ready to give up the presidency and hand things off to his handpicked su successor, Martin Van Buren. And, uh, you know, so Martin Van Buren, he, you know, he gets elected in 1836 and he comes in as the new president. And so we'll talk about him in just a minute, but let's kind of take a look at Jackson in review or Jackson in hindsight. Uh, probably the, the biggest thing you could say as we have historical, you know, a chance to kind of look back from a historical point of view is that for as much as was accomplished in terms of democracy increasing during this time, you still have three major groups that, that you know, were not part of the democratic process. And, and definitely you could argue for African-Americans and Native Americans, they're almost worse off. And uh, so, you know, this, when we get a question like, you know, to some extent or how much, to what extent uh, was Jacksonian democracy, you know, a thing, you would, you would want to point to these as reasons that, you know, that wasn't the, the, the best thing in the world. But that being said, uh, in terms of white males, uh, more people were allowed to participate. Remember, because of party machines, uh, because of voter loyalty, the, sp the spoils system, we do see a pretty big rise in voter participation. And we get uh, some of our highest voter outputs in the 1800s because of these party machines and because we get rid of things like the, the property tax requirement, the uh, ownership of property, and we see the growth of these, these parties that they really go out of their way to organize the vote. And as immigrants start to come in, these people are courted uh, for their vote because they come in such numbers and as they become citizens, uh, they can sway an election one way or another. All right, and so even though that Jacksonians, they they accepted a certain amount of social and economic inequality, um, you know, but they, they did work at least to prevent barriers against white male mobility. And what I mean by that is that, you know, you had every opportunity to become un, you know, unequal as possible. What I mean by that is that you had freedom to either be, you know, to, to rise in stature or lo lower in stature based on your ability and based on your ambition and your effort. And so if you were a white male during this time, you, you would probably say that Jackson and, uh, you know, the Jacksonian era, that was a, a pretty good time to be able to be a person on the make, a person on the rise. But overall, in terms of the, the country's economic health, by killing the bank, we, we now see that this was a bad thing and that it created a lot of economic instability. And when you are asked about the Panic of 1837, you know, the greatest cause of the Panic of 1837 is probably that Jackson killed the bank. The bank provided a lot of economic stability. It prevented overspeculation uh, in things like Western land sales, uh, you know, over speculation in the building of factories. It really kind of uh, made sure that people didn't overloan to businesses. Um, it made sure that inflation didn't occur. That was not controllable. And it kept the interest rates within reason. And when the Bank of the United States is gone, then we go into this kind of uh, really laissez-faire system of, of economics where we just start going into these booms and busts and booms and busts and, uh, you know, the panic of 1837 and the subsequent depression that followed was a good example of that. And so that was that was kind of a bad thing. All right. In the election of 1836, and by the way, if you ever wonder why uh, Van Buren is called the little magician, uh, the rumor was that he was such a skilled uh, political tactician that he was very, you know, he was very much like a political magician. So that's why they called him the little magician. But anyways, in the election of 1836, the Whigs, uh, they, they came up with some kind of concocted scheme where they were going to try to have uh, three different candidates. And, and really all they were hoping to do was to make it to where Van Buren, they knew that he was the strongest candidate. They just didn't want him to get 51% of the electoral vote. So what they were trying to do was they were trying to split up the vote enough uh, that some of those people that would vote for Van Buren would vote for either um, William Henry Harrison out in the West, um, Hugh White uh, for the South, and then um, Daniel Webster in Massachusetts. And the idea was to, to just 
take enough of Van Buren's votes that it would be less than 51 percent and they would get thrown to the House. And then, um, you know, they then the Whigs could choose one of their candidates because, you know, they they were starting to gain control of Congress enough to where they could be able to do that. But as you can see on the electoral vote, if you kind of take a look at that really quickly, um, you can see that that didn't happen. And, and Van Buren, he was able to win nearly 60 percent of the electoral vote and over 51 percent of the popular vote as it as it didn't matter as much. But um, that's how Van Buren becomes president. <clears throat> and it's it's not as much as about him as the disunity of opposition <laughs> against him, probably. If they would have united under one candidate, they'd have probably had a better chance. All right, not much that you need to know about the, the presidency of Martin Van Buren, but probably the biggest thing they're gonna ask you, AP is gonna ask you is that his presidency was just uh, tarnished by the Panic of 1837. He really inherited the Panic of 1837 because of Jackson's policies. And what's kind of interesting is that um, you know, the Panic of 1837 ends up hurting the common man or the farmers and people like that the most, but yet they didn't blame Jackson for it. They, they blamed the Eastern elite. They blamed the bankers. They blamed, you know, Nicholas Biddle, the, the president of the Bank of the United States, but they didn't blame Jackson. Um, and then Martin Van Buren had to deal with kind of the fallout of that. And a lot of people started to blame him. Uh, you know, Jackson was kind of Teflon. Things just didn't stick to him. And uh, so, you know, Van Buren is a, just a one term president. And probably the biggest reason is the Panic of 1837. During his four years as presidency, uh, they're dealing with economic depression. And typically presidents don't, don't get reelected when the economy is not doing well. All right. So the main cause of the Panic of 1837, you should write down, is the, you know, Jackson's killing of the Bank of the United States start to make the uh, economy kind of unstable. There are some other causes too, not as big as that one, but um, you know, there's a, a depression going on in Britain at the time. And so they were starting to uh, kind of be tight with their money. And so there was a lack of investment, uh, lack of loans uh, given out by British creditors. And um, you know, this, what you kind of need to understand about the, the, the late 1830s in terms of banking is there's an overall contraction of the money supply. And what we mean by that is that there's less paper money and that banks wanted to be paid in gold and silver and people like the farmers just didn't have the ability to do that. And so if you guys remember when we talked about like the specie circular, um, you know, when people bought land, they had to pay in gold and silver and farmers just couldn't do that. And so, you know, banks during this time were calling in loans instead of giving more loans out. And uh, the interest rates were oftentimes very high. Um, whereas, you know, if the interest rates are really low, then people are going to be more willing to, to get loans. And so, like I said, you have a kind of an overall contraction of the money supply. Uh, also during this time, because of higher production, um, you have less uh, cotton prices have started to, to go down for the first time. Up until this point in the 1830s, cotton prices have remained pretty high. But as we're going to see uh, from here on out, uh, cotton's going to be, you know, subject to the same boom and bust cycle uh, that, you know, the entire commodity has. And this is one of those things that also causes the panic of 1837 was a drop in cotton prices. And, and that's big because cotton has started to become our biggest export. And we were talking about in terms of total exports, we're talking about nearly 50 percent of all that is going to be exported from the United States. And so if cotton prices are low, then the, the, you know, the planters aren't doing as well, the, the, the farmers aren't doing as well, and uh, that, that hurts the depression as well. Okay, well, it's pretty soon thereafter that Van Buren had realized that getting rid of the bank was probably not the best idea, but because he's a loyal guy and because Andrew Jackson's still a very, even though he's not president anymore, he's still a very important figure in the Democrat, Democratic Party, uh, Van Buren really couldn't then, you know, get, get bring back the bank. And so he had to kind of come up with a plan B and that became the independent treasury. So the independent treasury is basically just uh, a place where the, the government could store their funds. And uh, it's a place where they could, um, you know, if, if they got paid for tariffs and they would put it in the independent treasury. So it's kind of like a sub banking system. 
But the big thing here is that they weren't, uh, you know, the independent treasury wasn't giving out loans like the Bank of the United States was. It wasn't regulating the economy. Is basically just kind of a storage place for uh, the the funds of the United States. And then if they, you know, if we uh, had you know, debt or something like that, then we would pay it out of the independent treasury. But I don't want you to think of it as a bank. It wasn't a, a bank because what a bank does is a bank is constantly bringing in money and then loaning it out. And this this was really just bringing in money. And if we had debts of some kinds, paying off the debt, but not really loaning it out to business. All right. And so that's really the, the couple of big things that you need to know about uh, Martin Van Buren. He runs again in the election of 1840, but the, the Whigs by this time have started to become more and more powerful. And what's kind of ironic about the election of 1840 is that they sort of out Jackson, the Jacksonian Democrats. And so the Whigs, they, they do exactly what the Democrats did. They pick a war hero. They pick William Henry Harrison, the, the, the guy from the Battle of Tippy Canoe. And, uh, you know, he was a governor of Indiana. And he had served in Congress and, you know, he was a war hero. And so um, he kind of appeared to be almost like Jackson, the common man, even though he came from a very wealthy family. And then again, ironically, Van Buren, who you can see in this political cartoon in the top right hand, is seen there uh, getting drunk off of fine champagne. Even though Van Buren was born of a pretty humble origin, they kind of uh, portray him as this aristocrat. And, hey, let's get the aristocrat out and the common man in, which is kind of almost exactly opposite of how it really was. But anyway, so they use the common man idea to get their own guy elected in William Henry Harrison. And so there was a, a newspaper that talked about how um, when, when William Henry Harrison retired from the military, that he was you know, given a, a pension and used this pension to buy a log cabin and and drink hard cider and hard cider was something that was drank by the, 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 the lower income people. And so uh, even though this, uh, this paper tried to kind of make fun of him, ended up casting him in a light that made him more appealing to his common man followers. And so when you see that log cabin and hard cider campaign, they're talking about the wig campaign of um, William Henry Harrison, who is kind of called in the slogan tippy canoe and then the, the next guy is John Tyler. John Tyler was not really a Whig. He was uh, more of an anti-Jackson Democrat. And so he gets put on the, the Whig ticket because he could rally the Southern vote uh, with the, those Southerners that didn't want to vote for Jackson. And so the slogan, Tippy Canoe and Tyler too. And that's going to be important because we're going to see William Henry Harrison is going to die very, very soon into his presidency. John Tyler is going to become the president. And, um, you know, he's kind of a man without a party. He's not really a Whig. And the Democrats don't really like him because uh, most of the Democrats are Jacksonian. And so it kind of causes a political problem there uh, until the next election. OK, um, that is pretty much it. And uh, we're going to stop there for today. And hopefully you have a good Monday. We'll see you in class this week.